Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CFC again. It's good to see everybody here. Um, I just heard someone sneeze across the street. It was kind of crazy. I was like, whoa, what was that? Um, first of all, just um, welcome. This is Communion Sunday. So if you haven't gra grabbed your communion cups, please uh, do so now or have someone from our team grab it for you and bring it over to you. Um, happy July 4th, and it's good to see everyone. Let's, let's take this time first to pray. And I'll jump us into our, our, our new series called The Once and Future King, Stories from Sir Samuel. Um, and there's a little nod to a famous old book, classic, um, but it's a little different. So um, let's pray. Father God, we thank you once more for this morning. We thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you so much for the blessing of this, your creation, of all that you've provided, all that you've given, even the blessing of this um, moment to gather as a body, as a family. For those online, we pray also for their time together with us here. Um, thank you so much for bringing all of us together as a family. Thank you for gathering us um, and, 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 and loving us and, and blessing us in so many different ways, but especially with your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And thank you for the privilege today I get to preach and proclaim your truth, your word from 1 Samuel, um, a passage I'm unworthy to preach because it is so rich, and I feel like I'm not going to even do a good job today, but it's in your hands. And Lord, I like everything, we all come with different, and from different times, places, at different points in our walk with you, um, different ups and downs. Maybe we started the morning poorly, maybe we had a bad week. For some of us, we had a great week, great month maybe, and yet, Lord, we all come in our different layers, different levels to you, our God who is loving, who is listening to us, and your timing is so good. Your grace is so good. I pray that we would today have a glimpse of that goodness in your truth, a taste of it, whether through my brother Allison leading us in worship, whether through me proclaiming your word. May you bless and be with each of us. And, and, and help us to come to know your word well by your spirit. And so in Jesus Christ's name we pray this, and amen. Um, one of the cool things about getting to read catechisms, I, I think the catechisms that we read kind of seem like a structured thing and it kind of seems repetitive, but what they do is reminds us for even a glimpse, a little bit of God's wisdom and truth of who he is, his character, his goodness, what it means to follow Jesus. And Catechisms are always very timely, and I think they're always, um, they're historically a way to build up the church. And so we recite them as a reminder constantly of what God is teaching us. And you, especially today's, I think it's very good, it's weird how God times everything, right? Um, and it's about prayer, and I, I think that, and in that song that Allison led, what was the song called? I, I was, the last one? This is Our God. I, I think that's such a timely a song today, especially with today's text. And um, I just want to say that. So uh, let me just start by telling you a little bit about our series, The Once and Future King. Um, obviously a title to a famous book, right? Um, but it's a really good book, by the way, if you ever want to read it. But it's not. It's just a title that I really like. And I've always thought of using it, but I never thought I had the courage to put it down until I finally said, yeah, we're using it. And it's about stories from First Samuel. And I think one of the things is our world today especially, and even like data shows, is that the, especially in the U.S., um, our, the next, this younger generation has a lack of knowing the stories of the Bible. Um, there's a lot of things that we assume people understand about scripture, and a lot of people don't have that foundation anymore. Maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, the, the, our country, a lot of people grew up with foundations of scripture in their lives, so they knew the stories of like David and Goliath, uh, King Saul and Samuel, the judge, but Today, a lot of people don't know these stories, and I think that's one of the reasons what precipitated me to want to share from 1 Samuel. Um, and I think a lot of times when we read scripture, we think of it as a moral standard of living. Read scripture, tells you don't do this, do this, how you can live well, but that isn't all that scripture is. It's far greater, far more deeper, far more richer, and it's not what the Bible, especially 1 Samuel, is here to do. Um, it's not just about moralistic thinking. It is a part of it is helping us to understand how to see the good of God and his love. But here, what I want to say is 1 Samuel is a historical story. It invites you and me. It's like a narrative that, to live like this. Um, 
It's what is it like to be a human in a God-made, God-ruled, God-created world? And that this is what it looks like to live as God has made us to be. And it's about living out your, your, your understanding of this character and the goodness of God in everything. So we're in this story as much as we're reading the story, we're seeing this. We're seeing God in the ordinary. We see him in the extraordinary. And God is the primary subject. He isn't just an object, right? He is the focus, but he's not just some object that we look at. It's not just about him, but revealing how the world works with him. When he is speaking, when he acts, when he is choosing, when he's loving, when he's saving and, and, and redeeming his people. And so when you see the different stories, whether Hannah, whether the stories of Samuel, of Saul, of David, and other people, each story points us to something more, to the once and future king. Right. Obviously, that's why we called it that. But personally, uh, what I'll share is it's the first book that I read that we awakened my joy for Scripture. And what I mean is um, my, my discipler at that time was my friend Thomas. And if you're from Santa Barbara, like um, I know Paul would know this. Paul had actually joined us before. Thursday nights, the Tapioca Express and IV, we would study First Samuel, and we, we, we studied it for a year together. And it wasn't every week we studied First Samuel, but it was awesome. Like, I just learned so much from the Word of God. It got me interested in the Word of God. So it, it made me realize my imagination and, like, how I could see things and visualize things was part of my joy of worshiping him and when I read the Word. And so that all came together. So my hope, subtly, is that you guys would, uh, re- it would reinvigorate your joy or your desire to read his Scripture. And so when we read through the narrative, we're going to look at it and we're going to see things that apply to us, but also see what God is doing and how God is working. So he is the center of the story and he is moving. He's moving in our lives too. So I just want to kind of say that today as an intro. And so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the entire text for now, okay? Um, Actually, I'm going to read part of the text and I'll read the second half later, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 uh, to chapter 2, verse 11. That's a lot of reading. So I'm going to read the first part, which is chapter 1. It's a big narrative, but what I want to do is capture the story for you, okay? And so First Samuel chapter 1, if you have your books or your Bibles, or if you have a phone, it totally works. But um, it's nice to have it so you can kind of go back and forth. Um, chapter 1, verse 1. And I want you to imagine it's kind of like an epic movie, that's how I visualize the story, okay? There was a certain man of Ramathiam Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Ilkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zoph, and Ephra- Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penena. And Penena had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hopni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Ilkana sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because of the Lord because the Lord had closed her room. So it went on year by year. And as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice wasn't heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. 
Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning, and they worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to the house of Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her, and in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for he, she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord a yearly sacrifice to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only May the Lord establish his word. And so the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of, ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord of Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Uh, this is the word of the, the Lord. Um, I'll, I'll finish with Hannah's prayer at the latter half of our sermon. But... Um, the context of 1 Samuel, you have to understand, is this is a discouraging and dysfunctional time. The pol politically, it's an unsure time. There's unrest going on. People have different views, different values. They're arguing. They're, they're, there's different desires for how the way the, the country should be run. Society's morals are lost. The, the compass has been kind of lost. The moral compass is being diminished. And this is happening after they had been delivered from slavery in Egypt. The people of Israel somehow, miraculously, by God's grace, was able to leave Egypt and go to this promised land. But along the way, God reveals his promises to them, shows them how to live as a people through the Ten Commandments, through the law, and through Moses. And after 40 years of wandering, guided daily by God's grace, God's promises provided for by God, they somehow end up overcoming all odds, conquering the land of Canaan, which was promised to them, this place of milk and honey, right? And against all odds, they claim what was promised. They reach their goal. And the people of Israel reached this promised land. Rather than things becoming better and things were perfect, they started to get messy. They started to get worse and worse. The things that were meant to go well started to unravel generation by generation from within and also from the pressures of the world around them. The countries around them were oppressing them as well. And when you get to the end of Jab Judges, chapter 21, the last chapter of Judges, last few verses, I think it's the last verse, it says these words. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In the midst of a lack of political leadership, there was division. The people were breaking down morally, societally, and they were struggling as a culture, and they lacked guidance. And if you look at the end of Judges, Judges chapter 17, chapter 18, chapter 19, verse 21, chapter 21, they keep saying, there's no king, there's no leader, there's no king in Israel. And so the people of Israel were looking for leadership, looking for a guide, someone to guide them. They were desperate. And that's the context. It's a messy time. There's a lot you can see that could be somewhat similar to our times today in some sense, right? I don't want to make too much jump, but I just want to set that layer, okay? And today's message is breaking into three points. The story of Hannah. Um, it's her pain, the prayer that she ends up praying, and then the praise that follows. The pain of Hannah, the prayer of Hannah, and the praise of Hannah. And what I want you to see, first of all, this is how 1 Samuel begins, the pain of Hannah. In chapter 1, or chapter one, verse 1 to 2, it says, In this hill country, in the middle of this little place in Israel, at the home of Ilkana, what we learn is a few things. Seems to be he's a person of decent lineage. He has a, a lineage that's listed down like four or five generations. Pretty well recorded. That means he's doing somewhat okay. And it seems like they're pretty well off. Has two wives, has a lot of 
finances to be able to afford traveling, right? Sacrificing. And so things seem pretty good. Another detail is he seems quite faithful. He's constantly taking his family to worship God at Shiloh. That's a big deal, right? He is a, seems like a faithful person. But then it starts to kind of show something wrong, right? And I don't know if this is a bad thing, but in the law, it does say we should be married to one person, but he's married to two. And that, as you can tell, uh, potentially could cause problems. And the problems you, we know, because we read it, is Hannah and Peninnah have a conflict, right? There's moral breakdown happening even at home. And that compromise is a reflection of, of an imagery, I think, of illusion of what Israel is going through, of compromise. Things look good, but there's compromise. And the relationship between these two wives is poor, and it's exacerbated by Peninnah's pro- provocation because she, what, has children, but Hannah does not. And you see and you read, Hannah struggles. And I think this is something we don't talk about enough as a church community, and I want to take a moment to address, which is that not everyone can have children. Not everyone can have easily bear children, and there is often a struggle to have children in a lot of our church families, not just here, but in a lot of people I've known. And the subject of infertility, even miscarriage and pregnancy difficulty is something that is there in our lives, in our communities. And that hurt, that damage, that struggle is often suffered alone. It's often suffered by the, suffered by the couple and there's no one to talk to about it in the community or even outside. And I've heard of many friends going through different aspects of this at different church communities. And the hurt, it isn't just physical, it's not sociological, but it's emotional. There's a spiritual pain, there's a mental struggle. And I don't want you to answer this question, okay? But how many have you have struggled with this pain like Hannah? With the hardship of wanting children but can't or not able to? And I'll say this, it's not just I'll take a moment. It's not just our women to struggle, but also the men here, right? I don't want to diminish our sisters, but also the women and the families that can. And more so, to get a little step further, how about those here that are single, who desire to be married, so as to have children, but for whatever reason, it hasn't happened. It's during these times that even during the pandemic and living in Silicon Valley, it doesn't make things easier, right? Our times don't help. And so that loneliness, that longing, it comes with the holidays, right? You, you think of uh, Valentine's, you think of Thanksgiving, you think of Christmas, you think of Father's Day, Mother's Day. Um, you think of all those holidays. And for some of us, those reminders come from different other days, marking moments when things didn't work out, things did not happen. And for others, it is years of unanswered prayers, painful disappointments, shattered hopes and expectations. And I want to start. Hannah knew this pain. She was feeling it, and it was worsened by Peninnah's actions. And while worshiping in Shiloh, she's reminded, seeing all the kids that she couldn't have, by this other wife having all these extra portions. In verses 6 to 7, it even says, her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. She knew what was bothering Hannah, and she would use it to irritate her. And Hannah would be so heartbroken being reminded directly and indirectly of her inability. And she felt worthless. Look at verse 16 when she's talking to Eli. She says, I've been speaking out of my great anxiety. But right before, she says, do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. Right? She's struggling with her own vexation, her own struggle of who she is. Because her worth, her value, in some sense, was connected to her need and ability to have children. And though this may not be a societal expectation, I know many of us still feel this. It has nothing to do with your value or worth, but perhaps you've been connected in some sense to yourself, your ability to have children. How many of us have felt this? How many of us have felt worthlessness? Perhaps it is because of wanting children, but you can't. For others, it is something else. Maybe we had hopes. Maybe we had dreams that were not met Maybe there's a sense of fruitlessness and worthlessness because things have not gone the way you had hoped, you dreamed, or you envisioned. What are the ways that our society speak to us about our sense of worth? What are the conditions or standards of life that are calling us to live a certain way or have to live a certain way, whether at school, education, a job, or career, or societal status, or achievements, or accomplishments? 
How many of us are being provoked in such a manner wherever we go, whether at home, school, work, at church, in our lives? And here's the crazy part. Nobody seemed to understand Hannah. Hannah, the first person she thought she could go to, her husband doesn't get her. He asks four times in verse 8, why do you weep? Why don't you eat? What's your heart sad? Am I not enough than your ten, than ten sons? And of course, he's enough, but still doesn't take away her pain. She doesn't get her hurt, doesn't get her ache. And then ironically, Eli doesn't get her. Her priest, her pastor doesn't get her. So um, guilt, guilty as guilty too, right? I don't always understand my community. I'm insensitive. At first, he thinks she's just drunk. He misdiagnoses and assumes the worst of her, that she's an alcoholic. He's not sympathetic. It feels like nobody understands or cares or is apolog- or sympathetic at all. And I, I want to say I'm guilty of this. I want to apologize first to my brothers and sisters, especially my sisters, because as a pastor, I uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm failing this, but even as a husband to my wife, I fail at it sometimes. And as a friend, I probably don't understand you well. How many of you have felt such a pain? Not only are you crushed, but you're provoked. But even the people around you who you trust the most don't seem to know your pain. You see the text, it's real. It's not disconnected from your experience. So when you read it and you can feel it, you're even pulled into it, that's the only way you'll understand the story better. Hannah's pain, her angst, her sadness, her discouragement, her loneliness, it's real. And so is yours. So is yours. And that leads me to Hannah's prayer. You see, no one seemed to understand. No one seemed to know what was going on. But then look at verse 18. It says, and she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. How was she no longer sad, you have to ask? How did she find such a measure of peace that she could literally wipe her tears, get up, and walk away, and go eat when she had lost her appetite? How did she go from struggle and sadness to the praise that we'll see in chapter 2? I think you have to look at verses 9 to 16. You see, she prayed, and that changed everything. Something about Hannah's prayer brought her from protest to praise. And what we can learn here will change perhaps how we walk in our sadness. I can't guarantee things, but I can tell you this is what Hannah did that helped her. Four insights from Hannah's prayer. First one, it says here, after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. She could have stayed in bed. She could have lied there grieving in sadness. And I know we've all done that. But she chose to get up and go to the Lord. It was an intentional, active, mental effort and a physical effort to approach God. I know there are days when you don't want to come to God. Intentional, active. Um, Crazy because verse 9, she got up. How many of us here in our hardship, our struggle, wanted just to stay in our pain in the status quo of it? Or will we be willing to go? to him first thing second thing she knew and saw him for who he was who he is verse 11 she goes to him goes to God and she says in her deep distress she prayed and she cried she vowed a vow and said oh Lord oh Yahweh of hosts if you indeed will look on the affliction of your servant remember me and not forget your servant but will give to your servant a son I will give to him the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Three times she calls, him, she calls herself a servant because she realized who she was talking to. Her posture was worship, her unworthiness, but he is her infinite God, the one who can do all things, the one who can change any circumstance, the one who was and is to come. She comes and lays everything at his feet, knowing that he is in control. He is the sustainer, the ultimate, the absolute authority. And she needed him so desperately. The third thing, she poured out her heart, everything, to him. Like a child, she came before him deeply distressed. She cried bitterly. 
She was troubled in spirit, verse 15, pouring out her soul, verse 15, anxious and vexed, verse 16. Everything is saying how pained, how hurt she is. And like a child, she was coming to her father in heaven for help. It was so real. It was so pained. And I'll, I'll, I'll say an illustration came to me. I never realized until I thought about it, and I, I read it somewhere, and it helped me to understand. But I know some of you here have kids, but if you're not, the cry of a child is a cry of faith. Because when a child cries, he or she knows someone is listening and will respond. She cried with everything she had, like a child to her father in heaven. And lastly, this is the craziest one. They all come together. She entrusted God with everything, with all the outcomes that could happen. She said, it's in your hands. The process of prayer is not a momentary thing. It was a journey reorienting of Hannah's heart to align with her fathers in heaven. You see, she left it in God's hands. He's, despite the misunderstanding of Eli, she prays. to, And Eli is a symbol of God's representation. He says to her, go in peace, verse 17, and the God of Israel grant you petition that you have made to him. And what happens after she lays it out? She says, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And she got up. She let it go. And she went up and ate. And her face was no longer sad. And I want you to understand, this didn't happen overnight. In verse 20, the answered prayer was in due time. We don't know when. We don't know how much time passed. But in due time, we aren't sure. But it wasn't immediate. It happened later. Today, many of us are struggling, as I've shared from before, with our struggles. Perhaps your struggle is like Hannah's. Maybe it's an unanswered desire, a dream, or prayer. Will you remain in your struggle, or will you rise and come before the Lord? Will you see him for who he is, and not simply what you want him to be? Will you pour out your heart to him like a child for her father? Will you entrust the outcome to him completely? And this leads me to the praise of Hannah. And what seems to have happened is that Hannah got what she wanted, right? That seems like what is the case. Is that what is supposed to happen? And at first glance, you think that because she does conceive. She has a child. But read carefully what happens. Verse 11. She says, If you indeed look on the affliction of your servant, remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. What she commits to is a vow of Nazarite. It's a number six. It's based on a Hebrew word, which means to consecrate or to separate. And Eli's response when she asks for this, right, in a sense, is may God grant your petition that you made to him. And what essentially he's saying is may God give you the Samuel that you Samueled. That's literally the word, wording. So it's like a word play. Samuel's name, I have asked for him from the Lord. And the truth was his whole life, everything about him was from his response to asking the Lord. Her child was given to God, which meant that after weaning, it was, she was, he was completely God's, not hers. She got her child but gave him up immediately, almost two to three years after perhaps, verse 23, 24, because he was God's. And what brought her joy in that moment? It wasn't Samuel. You have to understand it's not Samuel. It was not her child. What allowed her to get up to go and eat, no longer sad? And what allowed her to do so was that she was worshiping God. She wasn't seeking terms with God as though she was making a deal with him, like there was a transaction. She had surrendered that desire to God. She wanted a child, but ultimately she wanted him for God. And her desire was no longer for herself to be happy, it was for God in his glory. You see, what happens, and it's hard to say, understand this, but it, it's that prayer orients and transform us from what we want with our lives to what God wants for our lives. And once she entrusted God with her plans, her hopes, her desires, even having this child, she had peace because she knew and trusted God with everything. And that's why, I, I wrote this out separately, but she focused not on the gift anymore. She fixated upon the giver of the gift, who can give her all things. And that gave her the greatest comfort. 
And that's when she starts to praise God. Uh, let's read chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There's none holy like the Lord. There's none besides you. There's no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord of Lord God is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who have full who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and, rise, and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with prince and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. And then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy ministered to the Lord in the presence of Eli, the priest. Right here, four times she starts, she talks about her heart, her strength, her mouth, right, her enemies, everything is a visual. The visual here is of the image, the strength is her horn. It's like a horn, like an imagery of an animal rising above other animals. She's celebrating, she's praising God. And then she's saying, God, he's nothing like him, verse 2. And in verse 3 to 5, which he's, she's saying, this is the God I know. He is in control, not me, not the proud or the arrogant, but it's who, God who judges things, not the mighty who are strong, but the weak who can, God can use. It's not the well-off, but the poor, not the barren, but who God can make happen or not happen. Verse 6 to 10, what can he do? God can make all things. He can change outcomes. He can reverse the roles. It is God who can make things flip. God who can do all things, who can turn the worst things into good things, who can turn the heartbreaks into praises, who can turn injustice into justice, who can turn hopelessness into hopefulness, who can turn hatred into love. How? How could God do all these things? This was her God, and she understood that he could do all things, and once she understood this, her prayers turned to praise. When you seek only the comfort in the finite realities of this world, these things will never be enough to comfort you. It's only when you put your trust in the infinite God that you will find what is enough to truly comfort. Hannah could only praise God because she had found God to be greater than any of her doubts, any of her struggles, any of her anxieties, any of her worries. He is greater than her suffering, her discouragements, her heart brokenness and her sadness. God was bigger and more sufficient than her struggles and her sins. You see, what God needed more than anything wasn't an explanation or a justification. What she needed was to encounter her infinite God personally. She couldn't fix or reverse what was going on. She couldn't redeem or save herself, but she could go to the one that can do all things. And Hannah placed those needs at her creator's feet. And she wanted his plan above all things, and oh, did it come about. You see, Hannah just wanted a child, but God set in motion something far greater, right? It wasn't about Samuel, because Samuel ends up bringing about the king, King David, the promised king, right? But it wasn't King David first, right? It was Saul first, right? But yet, these seemingly so insignificant things brings about salvation for Israel, or a change for Israel for the good, supposedly, right? But all of this today, I want to stop us a moment to think. How can I pray and sing like Hannah? Because as you see her prayer and your praise, I'm sure you're feeling encouraged. And yet perhaps you're wondering, oh, if I could have such faith. Or if I could have such peace. And the crazy part is, as we get to the end of this praise that Hannah makes, she starts talking about a king. Right, she says, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. That word is Messiah. And it's like, what is she talking about? Why does she start talking about a king, right? And 
for the first time in 1 Samuel, the word Messiah comes up. And she's praying, in a sense, a preview of the entire 1 Samuel story of what will happen. Her story was a story of Israel and the king to come. But not just any king, not just David even, but someone far greater. Wouldn't be a Saul, wouldn't be a David. Who is she praying about? And I would turn you to the place in chapter uh, 1, verse 23. It says here, only may the Lord establish his word. The word establish here is the same word, rose, uh, same verb, same Hebrew word for rose. As Hannah actively rose up to pray and seek her God, her God was rose up and was establishing his word. Who is this? You see, Hannah is prefiguring what God has done. She dedicates her son to his service to the Lord, to his purpose. Our God did even more. He sent his own son, Jesus Christ, willingly to this world in its darkness where there is no true savior king. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And yet he provided us someone whom we desperately needed, the one who would save us, the one who would bring about the greatest role reversal against evil and injustice. Jesus lived the life we should have lived. He died the the death we deserved and need to die but by because of our sins but it was in his son who had to die jesus died so that you and me could be redeemed from our sin you and me in our natural desires we oppose him we turn away from him but jesus didn't just die right he rose again he overcame death after three days and this completes and finishes what needs to be done and brings a new day, a new arc in his story. In the greatest role reversal, God turns hopelessness into something more, death to life, sinfulness to salvation, mourning into joy, ultimate mourning into ultimate joy. Now, how many of you struggle like Hannah? How many of you had sleepless nights, times full of tears, heartache, sense of emptiness, unworthiness, struggle, discouragement, depression. Her story is your story. It's our story. First Samuel could have started any other way, but it starts right here. We expected a story of a king, but what we got was a private, painful story of grief, of a woman struggling with grief. And that's how our God wants to start the story of redemption. He turns her grief into joy and hope. I cannot promise you that things will be markedly better in your life. You will get your wishes answered. But I do know that in Jesus Christ, in our God, you will come to see his bigger purpose and hope. And in that, it can fulfill you and become your greatest hope and peace. It is a crazy, crazy role reversal that the gospel does. It changes everything. I hope that comforts you. As I read for Samuel, I got sad. I, I, I got sad because I don't know how to preach it well enough to tell you how beautiful her faith is. That's why it models Mary's prayer. In uh, this is uh, the church has two amazing prayers: um, Hannah's prayer and the Magnificat, which is um, in Luke. Uh, Mary's prayer, and these are both structured the same way. Um, and it's trusting God with everything, even when things don't make sense on our side. And It's letting it go to God. It's amazing. And our God answered. Our God establishes his word. He initiates. Let us pray. Father God, we come today. Thank you for that reminder of how you are the great role reversal. You are the great redeemer. In our loss and our pain and our deepest struggle, our loneliness, our unworthinesses, we know we can come to you, a God who has answered and met our need in our most desperate need for you and for salvation, you have redeemed us. And you are our hope. You are our peace. You are all we can have. I know there's things that I cannot comfort my brothers, sisters enough, my sisters especially. Oh, I wish I could, but I know, Lord, you love them. You have given up your own child for them because you love them so much to redeem them. And you are enough. I pray that you would be enough for us. We would remember that you're sufficient today. And especially in communion, as we remember you, as we celebrate you, may we see that and celebrate the great role reversal.
and that love that you have given. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I always forget, but take a moment to grab your communion elements, prepare it. And what I'm going to do is share from the Lord's Supper from Paul's words in Corinthians. And after we read them,